At the start of 1814, the island of Elba, just off the coast of Tuscany, was ruled by Elisa Bonaparte, sister of the French emperor. However, the situation was in dire straits for House Bonaparte. Two and a half months earlier, Napoleon had been decisively defeated in the climactic Battle of Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations, the largest ever in European history to that point. Coming on the heels of disastrous defeats in Russia and Spain, Napoleon's failure in Germany meant that he was now forced to defend his core possessions in France and Italy. By early April, Napoleon had been separated from his troops in Paris and the city had surrendered. Meanwhile, further to the north from Elba, the Imperial Austrian army had occupied Lucca, another part of Princess Elisa's crown lands. On the 6th, having run out of options, Napoleon agreed to unconditionally surrender. Five days later, the terms of a peace treaty were agreed to. Napoleon had named his son as successor, but the terms of the treaty provided no guarantee for this. Instead, the great powers had already agreed that the pre-revolution Bourbon dynasty would be restored to the French throne. Napoleon would be allowed to keep his imperial title, along with a personal guard of 400 men and a small fleet of transport boats. However, the empire he would now rule over was reduced to just the island of Elba, along with its satellite, Pianosa. With little choice in the matter, Napoleon reluctantly signed the treaty on April 13th. As the emperor prepared to take personal charge of his new principality, the British made sure the peace would be enforced by landing troops on Corsica, ensuring that power on the island was assumed by the new French regime. Also at this time, the Republic of Genoa, which had been annexed by Napoleon, was restored, and with it, Genoese control over the small island of Capriya. The former mainland possessions of Elisa Bonaparte, namely Lucca and Piombino, became part of the Habsburg-led Grand Duchy of Tuscany. The British and French also enacted additional measures to make sure Napoleon was contained, most prominently the continuous sailing of warships through the Tuscan archipelago. Although Napoleon arrived on Elba in a somewhat depressed state, he soon set about embarking on massive projects for his new principality, gaining a renewed vigor as he refound his footing as a leader. He commissioned the draining of swamps, the building of roads, and the construction of urban water and sanitation systems. He modernized the agricultural sector and chartered mining enterprises. He overhauled the island's school system and personally rewrote its legal code, instituting most aspects of what had by then become known as Napoleonic Law. After British raids four years earlier had taken a toll on the smaller outlying island of Pianosa, Napoleon would make two visits and facilitate a host of projects, including the reconstruction of its houses and guard towers, as well as leaving behind a small garrison. Napoleon would continue to drill and maintain in fighting condition his remaining guard, consisting of 566 members of the old Imperial Guard, as well as a regular force of 300 grenadiers. He also set up a 300-man local gendarme under the command of Captain Paolo Filidoro. Napoleon's mindset was well illustrated by the fact that he continued to refer to his small collection of boats as the Navy. This consisted of just a single warship, the Inconstant, along with two smaller auxiliaries. This Navy was originally commanded by Lieutenant Francois-Louis Taillad. However, in January, Inconstant nearly sank during a storm, then was driven ashore by another storm and badly damaged. Lieutenant Taillad was relieved of command, replaced by Lieutenant Jean-Francois Chotard. Although his second wife, Marie-Louise of the Austrian Habsburg family, stayed away, Napoleon was joined on the island by his mother and sister. His lover, Polish noblewoman Marie Walewska, did also visit, while Napoleon also took a new love interest, a local girl named Spara. Napoleon frequently spent slower portions of the day taking in the island's mountaintop vistas, oftentimes gazing across to the rocky shores of Corsica, Napoleon's homeland where the 45-year-old had spent the first nine years of his life. What must have been going through his mind? now, just 32 miles but a lifetime away. The reality was that the administration of Elba could only occupy Napoleon's attention for so long. Things looked increasingly bright for Napoleon. Despite his removal, the coalition arrayed against him was engaged in vicious negotiations. As the peace conference at Vienna threatened to devolve into a renewed European war, Napoleon clandestinely acquired a few more ships while receiving intelligence reports from France. These were encouraging and pointed to a possible uprising in support of Napoleon should he make his return to the country. He also counted on the support of his old field marshals as well as that of tens of thousands of prisoners of war released by the coalition. On the 26th of February, during a momentary break in the British and French naval patrols around the island, Napoleon boarded the Inconstant. 
Along with the Inconstant and its two original auxiliaries, four additional transport ships joined the fleet on its journey toward the French mainland. In addition to the Emperor himself, this all-important operation was commanded by Lieutenant Chotard, as well as the reinstated Lieutenant Tayad. On the journey, they supposedly passed a French royalist ship, unfurling the Imperial tricolor as the fleet breezed past. On March 1st, Napoleon and his force of around a thousand men landed on the coast near Cannes. They met no opposition, and the few royal Royalist troops they did encounter quickly dropped their weapons and defected to Napoleon's side. As resistance melted away, Napoleon continued his triumphal march to Paris, the route today commemorated as the Road of Napoleon. Napoleon's old marshals and their troops rejoined him, just as he had been counting on. As the restored Bourbon king hastily fled, Napoleon reascended the imperial throne, at least for the moment. Elba would retain its special status within the newly restored empire. The major question now was Napoleon's staying power. The coalition of the emperor's enemies may have been divided during his time on Elba, but as soon as he regained power in Paris, they put their differences aside for the moment to form a seventh coalition against him. Even after agreeing to put their differences aside, negotiations continued amongst the now more united allies. Indeed, on June 9th, while the military campaign was just beginning, the coalition finally agreed on the terms of the settlement that would come into effect following what they hoped was their renewed victory. Having already rejected numerous peace treaties prior to his first defeat, Napoleon would now have to inflict major losses on the coalition to have any chance at another peace deal to retain his throne. He took his chances and invaded the restored Kingdom of the Netherlands, with the border areas garrisoned mainly by British and Prussian troops. However, Napoleon was again decisively defeated, this time at Waterloo, outside Brussels. Following this infamous defeat, Napoleon had well and truly run out of rope. On June 22nd, Napoleon abdicated the throne for the second time. Once again, his son was named as successor, including to the title of Prince of Elba. However, the Allies had already agreed that just like the previous year, Louis XVIII of Bourbon would be restored as the King of France, returning to the throne on July 8th. This time, Elba and Pianosa became a part of Habsburg, Tuscany, and eventually part of Italy. To this day, the citizens of Elba celebrate Napoleon's time on the island with great fanfare. Napoleon's legal reforms and infrastructure improvements are fondly thought of in the island's collective memory. On the 200th anniversary, a large-scale reenactment took place, with hundreds of participants reprising the day Napoleon arrived on the island. The postscript for Napoleon himself, however, was far less rosy, being exiled a second time, now to the extremely remote British colony of St. Helena, isolated in the middle of the windswept South Atlantic. There, Napoleon was held as a prisoner and would be the site of his death six years later in 1821. Napoleon's year on Elba is one of the most fascinating yet forgotten aspects of the Emperor's legendary story. On Elba, this intensely complicated man is remembered more fondly than perhaps anywhere else he ruled, the lasting legacy of a unique time when this Tuscan island was the center of Napoleon's imperial universe. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like the video, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell button. Make sure to check out the project that forms the basis for these videos at apoliticalworldmap.org. And if you can, please donate on Patreon. For now, thanks again for watching. I'm Alex. I am out.